Hershon. He has 43 papers to his credit. He has also got voice cast fellow of BST during 2006 to 2007. And he had been a uh, co-worker at Assam University for one year in, during his beginning his, uh, uh, of career. Now I invite Professor Nayandeep to start with. Over to Nayandeep. Uh, thank you, Professor Sum. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Uh, uh, so I will share my slides, but unfortunately during my presentation, I will not be uh, visible. That means my picture okay, no will not problem. be there. Okay. So, uh, no so I'm going to uh, share my slides. All right. Hello, is it visible? Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes. Yes. Visible. Yes. yes. Fine. Okay. So, uh, up to uh, what time I I could uh, continue? This is forty-five minutes. So, so now it's eleven fifty. Yeah. You continue up to twelve thirty. Thirty. Okay. So this is an expository uh, this uh, talk. You can say so. Ramanujan has contributed uh, many things, uh, and one of them is his contribution to uh, the uh, series of pi. Okay, so I'll be talking about his uh, series on one over pi. Uh, to fill the work of Ramanujan in this area, uh, we need to know the early history or story of pi a little bit. So I will quickly go through them uh, here. Uh, this uh, you all know, we all know that the ratio of circumference and diameter of any circle is always a constant, and that constant is nothing but uh, we denote by the Greek letter pi. And uh, the ancient Greeks and other uh, civilizations, uh, they knew that uh, the circumference is just over three times of something, and that evaluating that something that uh, makes the history very interesting. And the various Babylonians and Egyptians, they estimated the value of pi as 3, then 3 and 1, 7, that means 22 over 7, etc. And there are some evidences for that. For example, there are some clay and stone tablets found in ancient Babylon, uh, where they were calculating this uh, ratio, you can see. And there are other evidences in uh, ancient Egypt, and those are written in papyrus. This is uh, this is the famous rain papyrus. So, and there is a mention of pi in the Bible also in Old Testament one Kings, and uh, this uh, two Chronicles four. Uh, this version is written. So it is written that also he made a molten sea of ten cubits from brim to brim, round in compass, and five cubits the height thereof, and the line of thirty cubits did compass it. Uh, roundabout. So therefore, the circumference is uh, uh, 30 and the diameter is 10. So therefore, the value of pi uh, from this uh, uh, ancient this Bible, that, uh, that is 3. And similarly, in Sulva Sutras in India, they also uh, trying to construct a circular vedi, which is equal to square vedi for uh, certain pujas. And they also arrived at pi equal to 3.088, something like that. And there are many other instances where this has been calculated. The value has been calculated. And in fact, Aryavatta, in his Aryavatta, uh, Aryavatya, so he written a uh, shloka there. So this is the shloka, you can, you can see. Chatura dhikanga, shatama, shatama gunama, dvasasthi, stata, sasranama, etc. And what is the meaning? Chatura dhikam, shatam. That means 4 plus 100, astam gunam into 8, and plus dua sasti sasta sastranama. That means 62,000 plus edited, uh, addition. So therefore, total is 62,832, and that is the circumference of a uh, of a circle having diameter 20,000. So this is divided by 20,000, 
and the value we get is 3.1416. And since the actual value of pi is 3.14159, so therefore from Aryabhatta's Schluker, we see that uh, this is at least calculated up to third decimal places. That means 3.141. Uh, it should have been 5, but this is now 6. So therefore, Aryabhatta actually com computed up to third decimal places. Okay. But uh, the, so do, there are many other ancient methods or ancient calculations uh, on pi, but the actual method or mathematical method was devised by Archimedes. So what he did, he took a uh, circle of diameter 1, one unit, Okay, so this is a circle of one unit diameter, and uh, so therefore this uh, perimeter will be pi because uh, circumference divided by diameter. So diameter is one. So circle. and now he inscribed this, uh, inscribed this, uh, uh, inscribed this with a uh, with a hexagon, regular hexagon like this. Okay, and there is a outer hexagon. Inner. This is inner hexagon. This is outer hexagon. Okay, and you uh, one can calculate the perimeters. So therefore, uh, one can estimate the value of pi. So he estimated that as pi lies between 3 and 2 root 3 because the perimeter of the inner hexagon will be 3 and perimeter of the outer hexagon will be 2 root 3. So therefore, pi will be definitely a number which lies between 3 and 2 root 3. And uh, what, is the, you know, uh, in, uh, what is the novel idea about Archimedes was that he can go from 6 sides polygon to 12 sides polygon and 12 sides polygons to 24 sides polygon. So he can calculate the perimeters of higher uh, sided polygons. So he doubled that four times and he arrived at 223 over 71. Pi lies between 223 over 71 and 22 over 7. And because 223 over 71 is 3.1408, and 22 over 7 is 3.142857. So therefore, pi must be 3.14. So therefore, at least Archimedes uh, devised a method where one can estimate. There are two bounds, lower bounds and upper bounds. So one can get 3.14 from there. OK. And his method was very powerful. And many mathematicians calculated uh, the value of pi by using his me method. And one of that was uh, Ludolf von Soylen and who calculated in uh, 1610 about 35 digits of pi. And this is his tombstone, where uh, new tombstone, where his values are written there, 3.14159, etc. You can see from the below. All right. Is it visible? Which one? No, uh, uh, my, my, am I busy? Yes. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. yes. OK. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So then the second method was this uh, Gregory Madhava Nilakantha, this uh, Leibniz series, uh, because uh, this was uh, based on calculus, which was uh, this, uh, discovered by uh, Sir Isaac Newton and Leibniz. So by using calculus, you see that this integral uh, has the value 10 inverse of x, arc 10 of x, and that has a, you can, one can expand it by binomial theorem and then integrate. So one can get that uh, this is uh, x minus x cubed by 3 plus x to the power 5 over 5 minus etc. And which converges for modulus of x is less than or equal to 1. And Leibniz in 1674, he put this uh, x equal to 1. And because arc 10 of 1 is pi over 4, so you can get a series of pi over 4 or pi multiplied by this 4 right hand side. So therefore, that is a series of pi. And if you truncate this infinite series to finite terms and calculate, then one can estimate the value of pi. So that is uh, this uh, Leibniz method. And uh, there are some. There, yeah, so this method was as uh, this Leibniz series, this Gregory Leibniz series was very slowly convergent. But uh, there are some other trigonometric formulas from where one can get uh, more convergent series like that. Okay. And, uh, and interestingly, this, uh, uh, this uh, Leibniz series, this was also known to uh, the uh, 14th and 15th century Indian mathematicians, uh, this Madhava, that was discovered by Madhava. So almost uh, 300, 200 years back. Okay. All right. So, so that uh, Madhava Gregory Leibniz series were exploited by McKean in 1706 to calculate 100 digits of pi. So this is the formula. 
So one can expand octane of one over five by Gregory's series and uh, truncate uh, somewhere finitely and then calculate the value of pi. So McKin used that one and he calculated up to 100 decimal places. And William Johnson England, he used the symbol pi for the first time as it is used today in his book uh, this, uh, in 1706. And he was actually describing McKin's achievement of calculating 100 digits of pi. And uh, that was a com uh, comp compilation of notable mathematical exercises. And so he found, uh, so he used that symbol pi for the first time. And before that, many other symbols were used like C and uh, rho, etc. Okay, and uh, once uh, the great Euler used that uh, in 1748 in his book, Introduction in Analyzing Infinitorum, uh, so that was widely now used. So the symbol pi uh, means the usual meaning today. Okay, and in 1607, uh, 1761, Lambert proved that pi is irrational, and uh, Ferdinand Lindemann in 1882 proved that pi is transcendental. So those are well-known facts. And so, uh, so this method was used uh, for long uh, years. In fact, in 1946, Ferguson used this trigonometric formula in Gregory series to calculate 808 digits of pi. Okay. Then these new mechanical calculators came and the first electronic computer, ENIAC, electronic numeric integrator and calculator to compute uh, 2037 digits by this uh, Metropolis, Reitwitzer, and Neumann in 1949. So, so new computers came and a new, new, uh, these digits were calculated. For example, in 1958, 10,000 decimal places were calculated by IBM 704 computer. Then 61, uh, one lakh digits were calculated by IBM 7090 calculated, but the methods were same as uh, Gregory's type series and trigonometric formulas. So this was by Stormer, this was by Gauss, and there are many other more formulas. And in 1973, one million mark was achieved by uh, Gue and Boyer. Gue and Boyer, uh, okay. So then the third method came uh, that was developed and that is called arithmetic geometric mean, AZM. And what is an arithmetic geometric mean? So you take two numbers, um, A and B, so you initialize that A0 and B0, and go on taking arithmetic mean and geometric mean successively. For example, your A1 is the arithmetic mean of A0 and B0, and B1 is geometric mean of A0 and B0, which is square root of A0 and B0. Right. And if we iterate, then one can see that these A k and B k, these two sequences converges to the same limit. And this limit is called the arithmetic geometric mean of A and B. So that is the famous AZM definition. And in fact, uh, and, uh, Gauss ascertained this fact at the age of only 14 by considering some numerical examples manually. And he uh, actually related this arithmetic geometric mean and the uh, length of the Lemniscate. Okay. And he opened up a new, uh, new, uh, new field of research. Okay. For example, he took this example so arithmetic mean and geometric mean arithmetic geometric mean of one and root two so you see that on the left hand side your root two is there arithmetic mean geometric mean first two row you see so uh, first two row you have uh, one and one here uh, root two and one and if i take arithmetic mean this is your new arithmetic mean this is your new geometric mean and the first one digit is correct one 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 then in the second one you take arithmetic mean of this and these and that is this is this one and this is this one but the interesting fact is that up to four decimal places are correct you just notice the red colored digits and in the next one more than twice that means here four de four decimal places here there are nine decimal places are equal and here more than 18 are equal okay so more than twice so almost quadratic conversion so this is a very fast converging series and this gives uh, yeah, much more rapidly the digits in a, a shorter time and uh, there are many simple properties of AZM uh, this is AZM properties some properties and uh, Gauss actually uh, written some formulas for AZM and uh, Lemniscate uh, length uh, in his diaries and uh, later on it was uh, 
uh, yeah, it was founded uh, by Salamin and Brand in 1976. In 1976, uh, they have uh, they have found this pi AGM formula, and this is a very fast converging series. So, um, so this is the pi AGM algorithm. Okay, so you, you initialize a0 is 1 and b0 is 1 over root 2 and you go on taking the arithmetic mean and geometric mean uh, and then you will see that this pn, the last uh, third row from the last one, pn, that will converge to pi quadratically. Successive iterations will produce 1 digit, 4 digit, 9 digit, 20 digit, 42 digit, 85 digit, etc. decimal digits. So therefore, after a few iterations, one may get a million digits. So this is a very fast converging series. And uh, at the same time, uh, two uh, uh, mathematician brothers, uh, Jonathan and Peter Borowins, they also developed some quad quadratic and quartic algorithms, nonic algorithms, etc. And all these actually follow from Ramanujan's modular equations, different orders of modular equations. So they were developing those Ramanujan series. So I'll come to that point. And there also they found some uh, very nice algorithms. Okay. So in 1983, using uh, those AGM algorithm and uh, borrowing quartic and quadratic uh, algorithms, etc. So Tamura and Kanada of Japan in 1983, they calculated over 16 million digits of pi. Okay. 16 million uh, 777,206 digits of pi by using AGM type algorithm. Okay. And there uh, stays the uh, before Ramanujan. Yeah. Then before Ramanujan means then Ramanujan came came into the picture. So uh, Ramanujan died in 1920, and this year is the 100th anniversary. So he died in 1920, but after almost uh, 60 years, his uh, this uh, Pi series were uh, you can say rejuvenated. Some of his Ramanujan's approximations were like this. So very beautiful approximation from you see uh, second one, third one, fourth, fifth, etc. So these four formulas, actually those, uh, so he wrote one paper after coming to England in 1914, the paper was modular equations and approximations to pi. And uh, almost uh, nothing was proved in that paper, only the statements and some hints. Okay, so uh, he said that by using class invariance and uh, singular moduli, he can calculate the uh, uh, different approximations of pi and as well as series for pi. So he he actually recorded 17 series for one of our pi, apart from recording those uh, approximations that I have shown here on the left, this side. Okay, so these are approximations by Sards. And uh, apart from that, he recorded 17 series of one of our pi. And the, all the series were discovered by Ramanujan in India because before his arrival in England, because those were written in his original second and third notebooks, okay, which were written prior to Ramanujan's departure from England. The first trees are also located on a piece published with Ramanujan's last notebook. And uh, these are his first three series. And he said that these are from classical theory of elliptic functions. So you see that uh, on the left hand side, the series has 4 over pi. And second one is 16 over pi and 32 over pi. And interestingly, these series appear uh, in a Disney film uh, that is called High School Musical. And I think many of you have already uh, enjoyed this film. film. So in this film, uh, you see that the teacher is writing Ramanujan series 4 over pi. And next one is what? 8 over pi. But actually, Ramanujan series were what? And the second one was 16 over pi. And this is a very bright student, uh, Hazins, uh, Venisa Hazins. So uh, to show that she is very bright, so she points out to the teacher that it should be 16 over pi instead of 8 over pi. So the teacher is asking, is it? Then uh, uh, she is checking her notes, and it is corrected. And, there, and this is a good job for Venisa Hazins. Okay. okay. So that is that. Uh, the, you, can, you can enjoy the scene in YouTube that is available. Okay. And after offering the three formulas of uh, one of our pi in classical base, at the beginning, beginning of section 14, uh, he said there are corresponding theories in which Q is replaced by 
one or other of the functions. And you see that these are hypergeometric series and here one over R. When R equal to two, it is half, and half, half, one, and one minus X. And the numerator of uh, this one, numerator of this one, when R equal to two. And that is the classical theory actually. Okay. And Ramanujan said that there are corresponding theories where R can be replaced by three, one, four, uh, four, and six. That means it should be uh, the hypergeometric series which arguments one over three, two over three, or one over four, and three over four, etc. Okay, so these are the corresponding theories of Ramanujan. He said that there are corresponding theories, and he can develop uh, from those corresponding theories more series of pi, one over pi, and he actually recorded 14 for the series representation for one over pi. Two in uh, uh, that's Q3, then 10 series in Q4, quartic theory, and this is sextic theory to series. Okay, so 14 more series. And uh, Ramanujan series, uh, these are the alternative series. These are first two, then uh, the red ones are this one, and this is four, uh, the quartic theory. Yes. 10 series are quartic theory, and uh, two series each for cubic and sextic theory. Okay. And Ramanujan re never returned to the corresponding theories in his published paper, but six pages in his second notebook are devoted to developing these theories. And initial steps were taken by K. Bhankata Chaliangar of Madurai Kamraj University in developing those alternative theories. And uh, he examined some of the entries of Ramanujan in alternative theories. All of the results on those six pages of Ramanujan's notebook were proved in a paper in 1995 by uh, Bruce Barnt, uh, Bhargava, and Frank Garvan. And that was published in Transaction of American Mathematical Society. Uh, and 14 years after the publication of Ramanujan's epic paper, the first mathematician to address Ramanujan's series for 1 over pi was S. S. Chawla in 1920-29. So he also developed some uh, some theories and Saula gave the first published proof of a general series representation for 1 over pi and used it to derive Ramanujan's series, this one. And the Ramanujan series were then uh, forgotten by the mathematical community until November 1985 when R. William Gospar Jr., Bill Gospar, uh, popularly known as, used one of Ramanujan series. This is the last series uh, Ramanujan written in his paper. And uh, from this series, yes, he series, calculated. Series, 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 series. Hello, I have some disturbances. Hello, am I audible? No, I think, yes, yes, I think it is. Okay, so uh, he calculated over 17, 17 million decimal uh, digits of pi by using Ramanujan's formula. And at that time, it was a world record because uh, before that, uh, Tamura and Kannada uh, calculated over 16 million decimal places by using AZM method. So when Gospar calculated over 17 million digits, then everybody knew that uh, this must be true. Otherwise, uh, so many digits cannot be equal in the, uh, like that. And But the one problem was that this formula uh, had not yet been proved at that time. Uh, so in 1987, uh, Jonathan Borwin and Peter Borwin, they were working. And in 1987, they proved actually uh, Ramanujan's all series of 1 over pi, all 17 series. And uh, in a series of papers after that, they, uh, they established several further series for 1 over pi. And with one of their series yielding roughly 50 digits of pi per term. And Ramanujan's uh, formula, which Gospar used, the, that gives roughly 8 digits per term. So therefore, many more series were developed, uh, developed by uh, Borowinds. And at, at about the same time as the Borowinds are devising their proofs, another two brothers, this, uh, uh, from Russia, but now in America, so David and Gregory Sudnovsky, they also derived new series representations for 1 over pi by using complex multiplication theory. So in particular, the Sudnovskys used their series. This is their famous series. They calculated the world record of, uh, uh, you see that 2 billion digits of pi, over 2 billion digits of pi. And there are many other calculations in between. So I have skipped those. 
but this is one of the most important fit by the Sudnovskis. And uh, uh, current Mathematica uses this formula to calculate the digits of pi when you ask uh, for evaluation of uh, digits of pi in Mathematica. Okay. And in the last few years, further particular series representations for one over pi as well as some general formulas were subsequently derived by uh, many authors. And in particular, Heng Huat Chen, he devoted uh, much time in uh, developing those Ramanujan type series. Uh, and there are many uh, uh, these uh, papers, so I have written just some of them only. So there are hundreds of papers on uh, Ramanujan type series. And the most recent one I have seen is in 2020, just in uh, last July. Okay, by Chu. And where he again, uh, div uh, again, uh, again presented new proofs of Ramanujan's series, some of the Ramanujan series, by using some well poised uh, hypergeometric series, basic hypergeometric series. So, in the recent years, many other formulas were found by Jesus Guilera, and he uh, discovered some beautiful series for 1 over pi as well as for 1 over pi squared. And there are many papers by Guilera, so interested uh, the audience can go through his website. Okay. And uh, so he used some uh, method that is called wilf zilberger pair, so WZ pair, WG pair. And uh, so this I just go. So uh, Zilberger's computer ahead and uh, Zilberger. So proof uh, that we're the first to use this method to derive a one page proof of the representation of pi uh, given by Ramanujan. Actually, this was first proved by Boyer in 1859. And Ramanujan recorded as an example in section 7 of chapter 10 in his second notebook. This is. And in, in 1905, uh, the generalizing Bauer's approach to Glasher, uh, he also found further cities for one of our pi. And Guilera found many new uh, WZ pairs, FZ, okay, and he found many other cities for one of our pi squared. Okay. And similarly, Wadim Judilin, he also found many uh, new cities for one of our pi as a pi squared. And uh, another development was there in 1997. Uh, Van Hame, so he observed that several Ramanujan-like series of 1 over pi admits uh, actually very nice conjectural p analogs. And he conjectured uh, 13 uh, series, and out of these 13, he uh, actually able to prove three of them. And the rest of these were proved, uh, com uh, complete proof, uh, the last one, 13th one, and that, that was proved by uh, Osborne and uh, his co-author, okay, uh, Osborne and I think Zudilin. So they proved in 2016, the last of the 13 series uh, conjectured by uh, Van Hame. Okay. And uh, by using uh, WZ method, Zudilin proved many more super congruences. And uh, in fact, the last, this year also, there are many more papers on these super congruences. For example, Ramanujan, so this is your Ramanujan series, first one. And second one, you see that this is P analog of this uh, series, the modulo P cube. Okay, so if you truncate the infinite series of Ramanujan at P minus one for a prime, P greater than two, then you see that this satisfied very nice, uh, this congruence for this. So this is congruent to uh, this one, modulo P cube. So that is by Zudilin. And there are many more there. So one can see his papers. Similarly, Guilera, this is a series by Guilera and Zudilin's this super congruence. Okay. And uh, so I also, uh, we, along with Professor Barnt, I started the Ramanujan series of one over pi. So in fact, what we did that uh, though Borowitz and other people, they proved Ramanujan type series for one over pi, but many of the uh, proofs, uh, they used uh, some modern techniques and other, uh, other theories developed after Ramanujan's part. So we tried to systematically prove uh, most of Ramanujan's original representation for one of our pi, and we also established a plethora of new such identities as well. And uh, what we used is that uh, we used Eisenstein uh, series, some representations for Eisenstein series. And left-hand side is famous Einstein, and on the right-hand side we have Eisenstein. 
So uh, one can define Ramanujan's Eisenstein series PQ as this one. And in his paper, Ramanujan actually recorded 12 representations for n of p with argument uh, argument uh, q to the power twice n, and this is p of q squared, and corresponding to 12 values of n, namely 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., up to 35. And he also recorded the representations for n equal to uh, 2, 3, 4 in chapter 17, uh, and the remaining 10 values for 9 and and also for 9 and 25 in chapter 21 of his second notebook. Okay, so these are the representations, 12 representations and further two representations. So 14 representations to tell. And such representations for this one with a particular value of Q, suppose we take Q equal to e to the power minus pi over root n, then the, uh, we will get a formula for, uh, formula for uh, this one and minus this one. Okay, so in terms of hypersymmetric series, and on the other hand, there is a transformation formula, this one. This is a transformation formula. So this transformation formula has plus sign, and this from Eisenstein series will get some minus sign. Uh, so this is uh, this is 6 over uh, root n by pi, and on the right-hand side, we, have, we will have some uh, hypersymmetric series. Okay, so therefore, if we equate, then I will get uh, the, the uh, series. And when you choose n, so this uh, root n that corresponds to uh, class invariance and uh, singular moduli. So therefore, if we know the singular moduli, and then one can calculate uh, infinitely many series for one over pi. And that was the method. And uh, this is so one can easily derive the, the transformation formula for Eisenstein series. Okay. And similar transformation formula can be found in other bases also. For example, cubic, quartic, etc. So we developed those, uh, some of those, and in our paper, Eisenstein series and Ramanujan type series for one over pi, published in 2010, we use Ramanujan's classical theory of elliptic functions to prove 13 of Ramanujan's 17 series. Okay. And in our next paper, in Journal of Mathematical Analysis and Application, we proved Ramanujan's cubic and quartic uh, theories. Okay. And moreover, uh, here in Journal of Approximation Theory, we derive several hypersymmetric like series representation for one over pi square. Okay. And in particular, those were for classical theory and theory for Q4 and Q6. And we had some problem in deriving similar series for Q3, and that was also we found. So for example, here, this is this example, you see that this is a series for one over pi square that's, that corresponds to some class invariant. And the sim same class invariant will give this Ramanujan's what? Uh, the original series of one over pi. So therefore, this is just perfect analog of ours is perfect analog of Ramanujan's famous series. So these are there are many others. So I skipped those our series. And for Q3 was a problem, and that was also solved uh, by uh, me and my uh, student Narayan Nayak, and that was published in Transaction of American Mathematical Society in 2011. So these are our new series. Many series we found for cubic theory, these are the series. Okay. And uh, so for a survey on Ramanujan type series for one of our pi, till 2008-2009, one can see our paper that was published in American Mathematical Monthly in uh, 2009. Okay. So now there are more series uh, like uh, what is called BBP formulas. Uh, is it visible? Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Is it, is it visible, BBP formulas? Formulas are not, only this is written BBP yeah. formula. Yeah, that is all right. Okay. So uh, there are some uh, more formulas, and then Ramanujan helped in deriving this actually. So how? So you see that this following series of 1 over pi, and there is a, uh, in the denominator, we have 16 power 3k. Okay. And these are something numbers. And this allows one to compute the billionth binary digit of 1 over pi or the like without computing the first half of the series. That means one can compute the exact uh, digit. That means suppose I do not want to compute all 100 first 100 digits. I want to cal calculate only 100 positional digits. Okay. So is there any formula for that? Uh, for a long time, people were searching for such a formula. And actually, Ramanujan formula gives uh, that billion digit of 1 over pi, not pi. So that was a clue, 
and uh, but uh, in fact the f- actual formula was found by some other method uh, they used ferguson and this bailey's what is called pslq method so th- uh, in 1995 simon kluf so simon kluf he found this formula he found this formula beautiful formula so you see that this is very simple uh, this part is very simple and this part has this denominator has 16 power k the terms have in the denominator 16 power k so therefore this will enable one to find the exact uh, binary digit of pi similarly because it is 16 power k so similarly hexadecimal digits can also be found so uh, their paper was uh, published in 1997 uh, in Met- uh, journal of uh, mathematics of computation and so because the, it is written by Bailey, Borowin, and Plough, so these type of formulas are now called BBP formula, BPP formula. So, and in 1997, Fabric Billard used those BPP formula to uh, compute 152 binary digits of pi, starting at the trillionth position. That means without calculating the previous uh, digits, one can calculate the binary digits. Okay. So, ex- exact extraction of the individual digits is now possible. Okay. Similarly, in 1998, Colin Percival uh, from Simon Fraser University, so he calculated the 10 trillion hexadecimal digit. Okay. And uh, there are more decimal digits calculations. And the problem is that uh, they have calculated this binary and decimal, etc. But there is no decimal BBP formula till then. That means in the BBP type formula, in the denominator, we do not have 10 to the power k type. So if we can find 10 to the power k type, then one can find the exact individual uh, decimal digits. But that is not possible yet because no BBP decimal formula is available till then. So that is an open question. Find the BBP uh, decimal formula. But this, uh, the, for other, uh, there are many other calculations of pi for decimal digits. For example, in 2009, over 2 trillion then 2.6 trillion, then 12.1 trillion in 2013, then uh, the last one I want to show. So in uh, last year, Pi Day 2019, uh, Google employee calculated 31.4 trillion digits of Pi. So it is, you see that, 31.4. And the latest record is, uh, this is uh, January 29, uh, Timothy Mulikan, he calculated up to 50 trillion digits of pi by using those uh, borrowings, quartic algorithms, Ramanujan type series, etc., etc. Okay, so all these are available. Uh, 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 these are possible due to Ramanujan's original development. Okay, so I almost completed my talk and hardly regretted that Ramanujan was not born 100 years earlier uh, during the great age of Euler, Gauss, and Jacobi because. I had he thought that if he would have born in there, then uh, those beautiful formulas uh, uh, will be much appreciated by Euler, Gauss, and Jacobi. But according to many modern mathematicians, Ramanujan should have been born 100 years later because due to the accessibility of recent, uh, the current Maxima, uh, Mathematica, MATLAB, those programs, Ramanujan might have done much more than, uh, I think, we do not know how he could have excelled in this at present time. So we have an uh, incomplete acknowledgement. I thank Professor Bruce Bourne for his encouragement and wonderful collaboration. My former and current PhD students for their collaboration uh, in this evaluating the series and the organizers of this webinar uh, and conference for inviting me to talk and interact with you. So thank you, Professor Soom and uh, all his team. Thank you so much. So, thank you, uh, Professor Nayandeep, for a very wonderful talk on thank you, sir. Pi series. Yeah. Now, any question? Yes. Quick question, if there is. Ma, uh, can you hear me, sir? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Ma, uh, yeah. This is Vivekananda. Ma. Oh, hello. Hi, Vivekananda. Yes. Yeah. Please yeah. tell. So ma, it was a really nice talk. Okay, it was fast. <laughs> yeah. So ma, you <laughs> have uh, mentioned uh, formula for one by pi. 
Uh, yeah. And as well as formula for one by pi square. Yeah. So um, I was just curious, uh, is there any in the literature, there is any formula for one by pi cube also, like or one by pi yes. power? Yes, yes. Recently, that dose has been developed. So you just go to Zudilin and uh, there's uh, Guilera's uh, websites. Right? Okay. okay. Recently, there is a paper. Okay, I see. Uh, those are also developed. Yeah. Okay, I see. So, okay. and one more question, like, uh, you were yeah. mentioning about, uh, like, Q3, Q4 there. Um, I have just seen, uh, like, uh, if I'm correct, only 2F1 was involved. Yes. Uh, so um, uh, is it like um, higher, uh, like three using uh, 3F2 also similar kind of uh, result? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are some results. So uh, other this one. So you can go to uh, Mike uh, Schulz. Schulz uh, thesis, uh, Bruce okay. Burns student, Schulz okay. work. Okay, nice. Okay. Uh, so means can... using higher um, uh, yeah, 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 series yeah. also one can obtain. Simply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. yeah, recently, Chen also found something. Okay. Hang Hot Chen. Hmm? Okay. So you just go through it in there. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I think there is no other question. Thank you again. Okay. Dr. Nayandeep. Let us give a big hand. Now, our next talk is by Dr. Thank Ankush so Goswami, who has completed his PhD in 2019 recently from the University of Florida. Presently, he is PDF at Research Institute for Symbolic Computation. Partition Analysis Group led by Peter Paul at Johannes Kepler University, Linz, Austria. His broad area of research is number theory. Now I invite Dr. Ankush Goswami. Thank you, Professor. Present so, his yeah. yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Song, for the introduction, and thanks, uh, Dr. Abbas, for inviting me to speak in this wonderful conference. Uh, so today, I'll be speaking about uh, arithmeticity and quantum modularity for uh, generalized um, conservic zagi. Uh, but for the time being, uh, let me just quickly outline uh, the main points of my talk today. So I have two main goals for my talk today. So the first goal. Is going to be uh, is going to be on results uh, on this paper, which appear which is to appear in Acta Arithmetica, and it is titled "Congruences for Generalized Fishbowl Numbers at Roots of Unity." And then the second uh, goal of my talk today is going to be to discuss the quantum modularity of the conservic Zagi strain series associated to this family of torus knots t three comma two to the power of small t, where t is where the small t is bigger than or equals to two, and this. And the second part of my talk is a joint work with Robert Osborne at University College Dublin. And, and this second part of my talk is actually a very special case of a more general result uh, with Robert. Uh, and, and the title of that paper is Quantum Modularity of Partial Theta Series with Periodic Coefficients. And this paper is to appear in Forum Mathematica. OK, so let me start with the first goal of my talk today. Uh, and to begin with, let me define what are called the Fishbar numbers. So the Fishbar numbers are typically denoted by this xi of n, and they are actually the coefficients in the Q series expansion of this function f of one minus Q. So yeah, of course I have to tell you what is this function f. So the function f of Q is the sum, it, it is defined to be the sum of Q of n, where the sum runs over all non-negative integers n. And this Q of n is the standard Q hypergeometric notation, which is valid for all natural numbers, including zero and infinity. And uh, yeah, as you can see, uh, can you can you see my uh, my cursor moving on the slide? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so so okay, so here are the first few coefficients of the Fishburne numbers of this function f of one minus q. So xi of one, so xi of zero is one, xi of one is one, xi of two is two, and so on. And the reason why this function f of q is called strange is because this function does not converge anywhere inside or outside the unit disk 
but it is well defined when q is the root of unity in which case uh, this sum reduces to a finite sum okay so i will discuss uh, i will discuss later what is mean by quantum modular form uh, but for the time being this function f of q is actually an example of a quantum modular object and a quantum modular object roughly speaking um, is an object which has very nice transformation properties when q approaches the root of unity and this fact that the function f of q is a quantum modular object was proved by Zagier in 2001. And these numbers, xi of n, the Fishburne numbers, these have very nice combinatorial interpretations. And if you actually go to the online encyclopedia of, int uh, of integer sequences, and then if you put this ID in there and search it up, then you can find a host of very nice combinatorial interpretation for, for the Fishburne numbers, xi of n. Okay, so now let me let me uh, briefly discuss some arithmetic properties of the Fishburne numbers. So it was Andrews and Sellers in 2016 who actually studied the congruence properties of this Fishburne number xi of n's. And then later, Verzoi, Kent, and Rowland, then Garvin, then Algren and Kim, and then Straub, they studied prime power congruences for the Fishburne numbers. So Andrews and Sellers results were only congruences for congruences modulo p. And the later results that came after Andrews and Sellers were, mo were congruences modulo prime powers for the Fishburne numbers. So, for example, uh, if you take, I mean, if you take modulo five to the power of r, you get these congruences for the Fishburne number xi. If you take modulo seven to the power of r, you get this congruence uh, for the Fishburne number. And similarly, if you take eleven to the power r, you get these congruences for the Fishburne numbers modulo eleven to the power. Of r. And then similarly, you can get more congruences modulo a power of a, a power of a prime for the Fishburne numbers. Okay, so in a recent work, what I did was I extended all these congruences, of course, uh, to prime power modulus, but at roots of unity. Now, what I mean by this is the following: so if you take zeta of n to be an nth root of unity, and you consider this function, so you see that this is zeta n minus q to the power of s times f of zeta n minus q to the power of r. And if you write the q series expansion of the left-hand side, then you get this coefficient, xi r s capital N of n. And yeah, this r is any non-zero integer and s is any integer. Then our interest is to study prime power congruences for this coefficient, xi r s capital N of n. So what Andrews and Sellers and others did was to consider the case when zeta n is equals to one. And I considered, uh, the expansion when zeta n is not necessarily one, but it could be any roots of unity. So to obtain prime power congruences for this general family of Fishburne numbers, um, you have to first consider this set S, P, R, S, and this is defined to be the set of all integers in between zero and P minus one, for which this difference J minus S is congruent to R times some pentagonal number mod P. So as I said, uh, so earlier works by Guerzoi, Kenton, Roland, Garvin, Elgren, and Kim, and Straub, they considered the case when zeta n is equals to one. Okay. Okay, so to describe the congruences for the generalist family of Fishburne numbers, uh, we first have to adopt a convention. And the convention is, uh, so if you look at these numbers, xi r s capital N of n, so these numbers may not be integers. So they belong to the cyclotomic, field of, uh, cyclotomic ring of integers. And so, when I say xi r s capital N of n is congruent to zero mod some natural number m, we mean that there, there is some other element in the same cyclotomic ring of integers, such that you can write this xi r s capital N of n as m times the u. So this is the convention that we're going to adopt for the rest of our slides. Uh, okay, and now to state our result, we first have to recall that every rational number n has a unique periodic expansion meaning you can write rational number n in this infinite sum, where the sum runs over all integers k from nu p of n to infinity. And this is the sum over, uh, uh, this is the sum of n k p to the power of k. And this uh, nu p of n is the periodic valuation of n. And this n k are basically digits. Uh, so in, because you're writing the periodic expansion of n, so these digits will be in between zero and p minus one. And then we write nk in this form. So nk we denote it by digit with sub uh, with subscript k of n semicolon p. And then the result is if p bigger than or equals to five is a prime and n is a natural number and r and s are certain integers, 
such that p does not divide r then for all natural numbers l and n and if j belongs to this set so one two all the way up to p minus one minus maximum of this set the set that you saw in previous slide uh, we have for each j this uh, this congruence for the generalized fishburn numbers mod p to the power of l so this is the first part of the theorem and the second part of the theorem states that if big n which corresponds to uh, the root of unity the order of the root of unity if this capital n divides r times p and if this triple p r s satisfies this condition that the that, that in the periodic expansion of s minus r over 24 the coefficient of p is this thing is digit uh, digit s minus digit sub 1 of s minus r over 24 p if this thing is not equals to p minus 1 then one can actually replace the set s p r s by this set s star p r of s and the reason for doing this is because sometimes for certain primes you might not get any congruence when you are in this set but if you replace this set by this set you might actually end up getting some congruences so that is the reason for the second part of the theorem okay okay so for example uh, if you look at uh, the coefficients in the q series expansion of f of minus 1 minus q then the coefficients uh, and if you write the q series expansion of that then the coefficients will be denoted by this so it's i with sub with subscripts 1 0 and 2 and then uh, this this coefficient satisfies this congruence mod 5 to the power of l uh, when you choose p equals to 5 and then when you choose p equals 7 this coefficient satisfies this congruence mod 7 to the power of l and then this is a different function so so this so the first one corresponds to uh, big n equals to 2 r equals to 1 and s equals to 0 and the second one so the second one corresponds to r equals to s equals 0 and big n is equals to again uh, 2. So if you write the Q series expansion of f of 1 plus Q square, uh, you get this congruences for xi 2, 0, 2, which corresponds to the coefficients in the Q series expansion of that. So you get this congruences mod 7 to the power of L, and then this congruences mod 11 to the power of L. Okay, so now, uh, so this is one generalization of the Fishburne numbers starting from the generating function for the Fishburne numbers. So the second generalization which I'm going to do is, um, is basically a generalization using knot theory. So I'm not going to discuss any knot theory here, but uh, I'm, going to I'm, going to, I'm just going to tell you how the function that I'm going to consider here is related to knots. So basically you consider the Konsevich Zagier series uh, associated to the family of torus knots, t3, 2 to the power of t, where t is bigger than or equals to 2 as follows. Uh, so this is the function so it's a big function and the highlighted things are basically quantities which are defined below so this mt is basically two to the power of t minus one this i is basically the characteristic function this h double prime t h prime t and a t are defined through this piecewise definition and this uh, this quantity inside square bracket is basically this square bracket thing is uh, the q binomial coefficient which is defined uh, as usual and then why this thing, why this function ft of q is called konsevich zagier series associated to the family of torus knots. I mean, why this has connection to torus knots is because if you consider, uh, if you consider the non-cyclotomic expansion of the colored Jones polynomial, which is denoted by that, and this non-cyclotomic expansion was obtained by Conan in 2016 in his PhD thesis. So one can actually extract this function ft of q from this, uh, from the non-cyclotomic expansion of the colored Jones polynomial, gn. And that is the reason why this is called a konsevich zagier series associated to the family of torus knots. Of course, it is not quite clear why this is called a konsevich zagier series, but I will tell you later why this is called a konsevich zagier series, because it satisfies a strange identity as the original konsevich zagier series. That's why it's called a konsevich zagier series, but we'll see that later. Okay, so, so one more reason why it is important to study uh, congruence properties for the coefficients coming from this function ft of q is because it is a generalized uh, it is a generalized version of the original konsevich zagier series f of q so basically if you choose t equals 1 and if you adopt usual conventions uh, you see that you will get f1 of q is equal to fq because uh, because if if i go back here so this inner sum simply becomes 1 and then this h double prime t and this h prime t simply becomes 0 or 1 something like that and then you Essentially ends up you essentially end up getting uh, this function f of q. This is what you'd get. 
And now one can define these generalized Fishburne numbers, xi of n, which are the coefficients in the Q series expansion of this function f t of one minus Q. So it is in the same way that we define the Fishburne number. So the Fishburne numbers are defined as the coefficient in the Q series expansion of f of one minus Q. So similarly, we define these generalized Fishburne numbers as the coefficients in the Q series expansion of f t of one minus Q. And then, yeah, if you choose t equals two. And if you write the Q series expansion of one minus Q, these are the first few terms in the expansion. And then similarly, if you choose T equals three, the right-hand side gives you the first few terms in the Q series expansion of F3 of one minus Q. Yeah, and then it was Bijavi and others uh, who actually obtained uh, the congruences for this family of generalized Fishburne numbers, Zit of N. And to state their result, and, and this paper, I mean, their work actually appeared on archive in 2020. And I think this is going to appear in print, or I think it has already appeared in print uh, uh, for 2021. Okay. So to state their result, uh, we first have to define a few things. So the first thing that we're going to define here is the periodic function, chi t of n, which is a periodic function of period three times two to the power of t plus one. And it is, def and it is defined to be one when n is in these residue classes and when it, and it is minus one when n belongs to these residue classes and zero otherwise. And then you also define this set. So this set is basically the same type of set that we saw in the earlier slide. So you define the set S sub P comma chi T of P to be the set of all integers in between one and P minus one for which J is congruent to this rational number mod P for those n for, for which chi t of n is not equals to zero. And you can easily check that when p is one, this set corresponds to the precise, I mean, this set corresponds to the same set that was considered by Andrews and Sellers in their paper. Okay, and now the theorem of Bijavi and others states that if p bigger than or equals to five is a prime and j is an integer in this range, in this set, from one all the way up to p minus one minus max of s t chi t of p, and then you get this congruences for uh, for the generalized Fishburne number xi t mod p to the power of n, and this holds true for all um, all natural numbers n and n, and this is true for all integers t bigger than or equals to two. So as I say, the the case t equals to one corresponds to Fishburne numbers. Okay, so for example, uh, if you take t equals to two and p equals to five, then you get this congruence for uh, for xi two mod five to the power of l. And then if you take t equals to three and p equals to seven, then you get these congruences for uh, for the for the generalized Fishburne numbers xi uh, of three uh, mod seven to the power of l. And then I also generalize their result. And um, to state, I mean, to generalize the result, what I have to do is I again have to consider, uh, I again have to consider this function zeta n minus q to the power of s ft of zeta n minus q to the power of r. Whereas before, this r is any non-zero integer and s is any integer. And if you write the Q series expansion of, uh, of the left-hand side, the coefficients are given by this thing. So it is xi with sub subscripts r, s, capital N, t. I forgot to put, an, put, the, put the argument here, so it's a small n there. And then you define a set s, t, chi, t, star. So we already have the set s, t, chi, t, p, r, s defined before. So now I'm considering the set S T chi T star. And this consideration is very natural because if you look at Garvin's paper, so it was actually Garvin. Uh, as I said in the, um, as I said before, that sometimes you might not get any congruence if you only consider this set S T chi T, but you might end up getting some congruences if you consider this set S T chi T star. So it is the, it is the, it is the main reason why I considered the set S T chi T star. So, so in the, in the paper by Bijavi and others, they do not consider the set S T chi T star. So it is basically uh, in my work that I actually consider this set S T chi T star. So you define the set S T chi T star as uh, as a set of all integers in the set S T chi T for which this con uh, this congruence is not satisfied basically mod p. Okay, and now you define the following set of primes by uh, by this condition that p one is the set of primes which satisfy the condition that uh, p is congruent to one mod three times two to the power of t plus one. P2 is the set of primes satisfying the condition that P is congruent to minus one mod three times two to the power of T plus one. P3 is the set of primes satisfying this condition. Then P4 is the set of primes satisfying this condition. 
and once again we have to adopt the same convention that we had before so uh, so if you look at the coefficients here so this coefficient may not be an integer but they belong to the cyclotomic ring of integers and so uh, once again when i say this is converted to zero modem i will simply mean that uh, there should exist some integer um, in the same cyclotomic ring of integers for which you can write the xi as m times u okay and now the result states that if t is bigger than or equals to 2 and p is bigger than or equals to 5 and uh, yeah and then n is a natural number r and s are integers be such that e does not divide r and if you uh, if you set these things for notational ease then uh, then for all j belong to this set from 1 all the way up to p minus 1 minus max of uh, stk t then we have these congruences for the generalized fishburne number xi with subscripts r s capital n p mod p to the power of l so this is the first part of the theorem and the second part of the theorem states that if p is if p is a prime belonging to any one of these four sets which we saw in previous slide uh, and if n divides r times p and if the triple prs satisfies this condition the same condition that you also saw in the in the previous theorem then one can replace the set stkt by the set uh, stkt star and once again if you choose t equals to one here then this union of primes so in the second part of the theorem the union of prime gives you the set of all primes bigger than or equals to five i think yeah, so this union gives you the set of all primes bigger than or equals to five when t is equals to one. But in when t is bigger than or equals to two, you do not get the set of all primes, but the union of exactly this four D prime family of primes. Okay. Okay. So now uh, a few examples. So if you now take t equals two and uh, t equals to three, and then if you take capital N is equals to two, R equals one, and S equals to zero, both of them. Then you get these congruences uh, for the generalized Fishburne number xi1022, which corresponds to the first function, uh, mod 5 to the power of L. And this correspond, these congruences correspond to the generalized Fishburne number xi1023, corresponding to the second function. And then, yeah, I just uh, I'm not give you the full proof of, uh, uh, of the theorems, but I'm just going to give you the sketch of proofs. So, um, so what you have to do is uh, you have to proceed as in Andrews and Sellers, Straub, or in Garvin, and then for the first theorem, what you have to do is you have to use the strong divisibility result of Algren and Kim, uh, which tells you that the that certain p dissections of the partial sums of this of this conservi Zagier function f of q are divisible by uh, are divisible by uh, q shifted factorial. So this is the strong divisibility result of Algren and Kim. And then for the second theorem, uh, what you have to do is you have to use the strange identity. So there is a strange identity which was established by Bijavi, Bowden, Myers, Osborne, Rushford, Transgard, and Zhao uh, in their paper. Um, and from uh, and then you also have to use the strong divisibility result of Algren, Kim, and Lovejoy in 2019. So these are the two things that you have to uh, that you have to use for the for proving the second theorem. And then to prove the second part of the theorem in the, in the second theorem that I showed in the previous slide. Uh, so in the second part of the theorem, in the second part of the theorem, you have to replace this set STKIT by this by this smaller set STKIT star. And in order to do so, one has to generalize a key thing which was established by Garvin in 2015. So the sec so this thing, so the, the thing that we do in our paper is basically to generalize a key result that Garvin does in his paper in 2015. And this key result is about showing that certain p dissections uh, corresponding to certain residue classes modulo p of the partial sums of ftq are divisible by p and then as i said earlier unlike in the unlike in the case of garvin this divisibility only occurs for four disjoint families of primes which are uh, which are described in one to four but uh, yeah and because t is bigger than or equals to two because you get these four families of primes so when t is one as i said the union actually gives you the set of all primes and then finally, you have to use Kumar's theorem to complete the proof. So Kumar's theorem is about the periodic valuation of the binomial coefficient. Okay. Okay. So this is this concludes the first part of my talk. Uh, are there any questions here? Before I can. Okay. So let me. Okay. So let me go to the second part of my talk. 
So the second part of my talk is to show that this function that you saw in previous slide, ft of q, is basically what is called a quantum modular form. So let me first define what is a quantum modular form. So a quantum modular form was, I mean, quantum modular forms were introduced by Zaki in 2010, but Zaki actually studied uh, quantum modular forms uh, earlier in his work, like in 1999, Lawrence and Zaki studied um, certain certain class of quantum modular forms, and then later in 2001, Zaki himself studied the original concept of Zaki function. I mean, he actually showed that the function f of q is an example of a quantum modular form. But later in 2010, he gave a very formal definition of quantum modular form. Okay, so a quantum modular form of weight, uh, half integral weight basically, is a function g from the from the set of rational numbers q to the set of complex numbers for which this function r gamma, which is defined from uh, q minus gamma inverse i infinity to the set of complex numbers, given by this difference, g alpha minus c alpha plus d to the power of minus k times g of a alpha plus b divided by c alpha plus d. So if g was a modular form, then this difference would have been zero for alpha in the upper half plane. But for a quantum modular form, this difference may not be zero, but rather this difference should extend as a real analytic function on the projective real line, excluding a finite set of points as gamma for each gamma in SL2z. Okay, so this is the definition of a quantum modular form that Zagier gave in 2010. And then later people modified this definition of Zagier uh, to actually restrict the domain of R gamma to appropriate subsets of the rational numbers Q. And they also allowed multiplier systems and transformations on subgroups of SL2Z. And one of the most influential of the original five examples by Zagier in 2010 is the Konsevi Zagier strain series F of Q. And as I said earlier, why this function F of Q is called strange is because this function F of Q does not converge anywhere inside or outside the unit disk but it is well defined when q is a root of unity, in which case it is finite. Okay, so now let me um, let me quickly tell you why this function f of q uh, is actually uh, is actually a quantum modular form as established by Zagier in 2001. So first we have to recall the original concept is Zagier function f of q, which is defined by this. So f of q is defined to be the sum of q of n, and this q of n is nothing but the standard q hypergeometric notation. And then in 2001, Zagia showed that this function f of q satisfies a really strange identity. So f of q on the left, so this is not an equality. So this is an equality within quotes, and the right-hand side is actually a partial theta series. And this equality within quotes simply means that the two sides agree to all orders when q is a root of unity. I mean, the two sides actually make simultaneously actually makes sense simultaneously when q is a root of unity. Otherwise, they do not make simultaneously when q is anything other than a root of unity. Okay, so what Zagier did was he showed that the right-hand side, which is a partial theta series, can be viewed as the Eichler integral of the Detkin eta function, which is a modular form of weight one half over SL2t. And then this Eichler integral has, uh, has quantum modular properties, which via one, one can show that fq has quantum modular properties. So this is what Zagier did. And we also adopted the same idea to prove quantum modularity of FT of Q. But to, but to do that, we need to have a strange identity for FT of Q, like we have for F of Q. So it was, again, uh, Bijavi and others who established uh, the following strange identity uh, satisfied by this function FT of Q. And it is given by that. So the right-hand side is, again, a partial theta series. And this chi t of n is basically the periodic function that you saw in in the previous slide. Uh, if you, I mean, a few slides back. Okay. And once again, this equality within quotes means the same that you know, we have in previous slide. And now to state our result, uh, we first have to define this congruence subgroup, this well-known congruence subgroup, gamma one of n, where n is any natural number, so it is the subgroup of all two plus two matrices in SL two z. Uh, with diagonal entries congruent to one modern and C being congruent to zero modern. And then if you set ST to be this rational number for notational convenience, then we have this result that if T is bigger than or equals to two, and if you take alpha to be any rational number and define this function phi T of alpha to be this exponential factor times FT of E to the power two pi I alpha, then this phi T of alpha is a quantum modular form of weight three half on this set, on this subset of rational numbers. And this is with respect to gamma one. 
of 3 times 2 to the power of t plus 2. So if you choose t equals to 1 here, this corresponds to this corresponds to the quantum modularity of the function fq, which was established by Zagier. And for and it is actually quantum modular from a weight 3 half on, on, on the set of rational numbers with respect to SL2z. So for t equals to 1, it corresponds to um, the set of all rational numbers uh, and with respect to the full congruent subgroup SL2z. But in this case, it corresponds to the subgroup. Okay, so now sketch of proof. So first you start off with this theta series, theta t of z, which is defined to be chi t of n times q to the power of this rational number. And then you define uh, the Eichler integral of chi t of z as follows. So it is the integral going from z to i infinity of theta, theta sub t of tau times tau minus z bar uh, uh, to the power of minus three half d tau. And this is basically a a path integral. I mean, you can. I mean, you can actually go from z to n infinity in any way. But yeah, you have to make sure that this integral converges. Okay, and then we show that this this function theta t of z. I mean, this theta function has exponential decay at the point z equals to zero and, and i infinity, and it satisfies a modular transformation property on gamma one three times two to the power of t plus two, and this then imply that uh, that this Eichler integral of theta theta t of uh, z, the Eichler integral of theta t of z, is basically well-defined in the upper half plane, including this subset of rational numbers. And then if you take any z uh, in this union, either in the upper half plane or in the subset of rational numbers, then we use contour integration to show that this Eichler integral has this, uh, has this series representation involving the incomplete gamma function. And then when you specialize z to be equal to alpha, where alpha belongs to this eight a of p times 2 to the power of t plus 1, which I show here. Yeah, if you choose z equals to alpha in this set, then one can actually show that the Eichler integral is nothing but some factor times uh, some some factor times this this partial theta series, and this partial theta series is nothing but the right hand side of the of the strange identity for f t of q, and this and this right hand side which is theta t of alpha satisfies this uh, satisfies this uh, transformation property on the set of rational numbers alpha inside uh, inside this set and this difference basically which is denoted by r sub gamma comma t of alpha is actually a c infinity function and is also real analytic in r minus gamma inverse of i infinity and it is given it is given explicitly by this integral equation a this integral uh, this integral form yeah, and that shows that uh, that shows. So basically, this shows that uh, this theta t of alpha is a quantum modular form, and via the strange identity that we saw in previous slide here. Sorry. So the theta t of alpha that you saw uh, that you saw is basically the right hand side, and we showed that theta t of alpha is a quantum modular form, and via this strange identity, it follows that f t q is also is also a quantum modular form. So that concludes the proof. Okay, okay, can you do that? Okay, okay, okay. Very nice talk by Dr. Ankush Goswami. If there is some question, please. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, I have one. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So in the first half, uh, the first part, the concurrence to prove something is zero modulo p power l. Those L is the maximum yes. component possible or? No, L can be anything. No, no, no. I'm saying that L is any natural number. No, no, no. It's congruent to zero modulo p power L. Yes. That L is the maximum power that divisibility property is true or is the. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you choose P, if the modulus says P to the power of L, then inside the argument of Zyte, you should have a P to the power L and yeah, minus so J. In the, the left hand side there is p power l minus something yes. the zero modulo yes. p power l in the right hand side there l is the maximum exponent possible 
Yeah, by our methods, yeah, we can only show that it is congruent to zero mod p to the power of l. But maybe a higher power of p is possible, even if this argument is same. But uh, but uh, from our methods, we can only show that it is true mod p to the power of l. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have one question. Question? Yeah. So can you go to the slide number uh, 15? 15 slide. Right. So theta uh, uh, function is with the uh, right hand side of one. I'm sorry. So after integral of theta uh, is the right hand side of yes. one. Oh, the right hand side can be viewed as the Eichler integral of this dead kineta function. Theta also, also, the which you are looking, taking this Eichler integral of some theta series, right? No, yeah. So because theta of star is a theta series, right? But Euler pentagonal number theorem, this is a theta series. Huh. If you take some other like uh, eta product or some quotient uh, and uh, uh, issue the Eichler integral, can you say something with uh, the series which you will be getting? Oh yeah, actually yeah, I forgot to mention here. So basically, in in our gen, in our work, in our more general uh, theorem that we actually show, um, that we actually have, um, so what we, do is we actually take a more general theta series with periodic coefficients, and then we show that uh, one of these theta one of one of these theta theta series is basically the Eichler integral of the other, and vice versa. Okay. Yeah. So you can actually take more general theta series and show that one is the Eichler integral of the other. Yeah, and show quantum modularity of the theta series. Okay, okay thank you. Is that what you're asking? Uh, maybe. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes. Any other question? I hope there is no other question. If there is some other, you, you can communicate over mail. And uh, I really. Uh, thank, I'm thankful to Ankush Goswami for his very nice talk on Fishburne numbers and quantum modular objects, etc. Uh, I hope that he will uh, in future also uh, join us later in some program also. Now over to Abhash. Uh, So, yeah, so Hello. we conclude this session and uh, we shall resume for next, next session at uh, 2 30. So, we will be having a break in half hour. We shall resume at. So, yeah. अच्छा अच्छा लेकिन एक साथ आओ लेकिन एक साथ तीन तो कहीं बैठता हूँ वहाँ पे सर प्लीज म्यूट योर माइक्रोफोन कौन सा ठीक है ठीक है आपके लिए बात कर लेंगे कल भी Abhas, is there any break now? Now meet around uh, two thirty. Ah. For next session, yes. Next session meet at two thirty, no? Two thirty, yes. Okay. 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 Professor Sudhir Kurpare, are you here? Yeah. Yes. Sir. How are you, sir? I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you, sir? Okay. So, do you remember your last visit? I think three, four years back. I remember. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. When things are normal, I will. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm. I'm very happy that IIT BHU is doing this. Uh,
conference and uh, you know abash is taking the lead yeah yeah this is the uh, whole uh, effort of uh, dr abash yeah and uh, of course i initiated that let it be let it be held here yeah so our thing so, sir uh, things are going on fine sir uh, in uh, your uh, uh, department uh, who is there in functional analysis oh yeah we have uh, young people uh, uh, of course you know professor lima used to be there I yeah, yeah that i know is he he still there or uh, he has joined somewhere else uh, oh yeah, but he, he has he's a he's an emeritus professor yeah so he, he yeah. doesn't uh, come regularly uh, yeah. then professor rekha kulkarni uh, is there she's about to retire now okay. that we have uh, many young functional analysts. Uh, uh, there is one uh, B K Das, the top Das, okay, and uh, Sauro Pal, Kanu Day. These are people who are mainly working in functional analysis, and then there are some people in uh, harmonic analysis. Uh, okay, okay. 